Okay, good morning and welcome to our uh, autumn 2019 uh, data protection update. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Martin Sloan, I'm a partner in the commercial services team here at Brodius. You'll notice at the back we have some cameras and we are uh, live streaming the, this morning's event, um, which we've done uh, over the, the last couple of years. Um, so if you want to watch it again, please feel free to go home and, and uh, re-watch it. Um, we will cut the cameras when we get the Q&A, so don't, uh, when we get to that part, uh, do feel free to you know, ask any questions that you have. Uh, they won't be won't be broadcast um, on online. Okay, so the, for those who have been to this, this event before, it's the usual format. Um, we'll take a look at um, what's been happening in the last six months. Talk about a lot of the sort of what we're seeing as key issues, um, recent developments, and then we'll finish off with a bit of uh, looking ahead in terms of what's happened over the last six months or so. Um, usual highlights here. So we've had some new guidance on the on use of cookies and uh, tracking technology. I'll talk a bit about that because that's some quite important stuff that's come out there. Uh, we had over the, the, the summer um, proposals to find British Airways £183 million, um, a staggering amount of money when, when you think about it in terms of what, what's involved. That's a proposal to find, it's not actually been issued yet. I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Uh, a lot more, so again, for those of you that have attended this event before, we talked about joint controllership and the increasing trend towards the courts viewing uh, relationships between parties of being joint controllers. We're seeing a bit more of that coming through. Uh, surveillance state, facial recognition, all that kind of stuff. Again, that's been in the news a lot. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, biometric uh, data as well. And then most recently, there was a, a rare win for Google in the courts um, in relation to privacy litigation, where they managed to uh, successfully limit um, the, uh, their obligation in terms of the right to be, be forgotten. So quite a lot going on. Um, we also had this uh, on the 25th of May 2019. GDPR celebrated its first birthday. This was a cake that we had in our office. Um, my daughters can confirm that that icing was as high in sugar as you think it might be. Um, they were pretty high for the, for the rest of that night. Um, it was a very good cake uh, and we, we enjoyed it very much. So what are we going to cover? We covered the last six months. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, cookies and tracking technology then go on to talk about biometric data, uh, then talk about data subject requests, so look at a couple of recent cases and some new guidance that's come out there, and then our usual roundup of um, other recent uh, enforcement action and cases in the courts that um, you, you may have missed. Um, this time actually we're looking for a lot of stuff from outside the UK, so with GDPR we have this consistency mechanism, so regulators across the, the EU should take a similar approach, and actually we picked up on a number of cases elsewhere in the EU that I say you may have missed, which I think are, are quite interesting. And then we'll finish up uh, with just looking ahead in terms of what's coming up over the next six months or so. Okay, so kicking off with cookies and um, tracking technologies. So for those of you that um, have been involved in privacy and any privacy in particular for, for a long time, you'll remember that we had major changes to the rules and use of cookies and tracking technologies back in 2011. And this all applied to what was called non-essential cookies, so things that weren't essential for, for a website to, to operate. There was a bit of confusion at the time in terms of what was actually required. Um, essentially, the requirement is you have prior consent, um, but as to how that was done, people were very unsure. So the ICO said, well, we'll give you a year to, to comply. That's fine. In November 2011, we got some guidance from the ICO. Uh, they seemed to uh, suggest that users didn't actually have enough of an understanding about tracking technologies for you to be able to rely upon what was referred to as implied consent. So this idea that just having a banner and saying, well, we're going to do um, use cookies, uh, if you continue to use this website, then you've, you've consented to that. The ISO said, well, users don't have enough of an understanding to actually do that. <coughs> but at the same time, in media briefings, they were saying, yeah, implied consent is, is actually OK. And they endorsed some guidance from the International Chamber of Commerce, which also said that implied consent was OK. So, very mixed messages coming from the regulator there. June 2012, um, so this was just when the one year grace period was coming up, um, the ISO revised its guidance and it gave lots of examples, a number of examples where um, you wouldn't need to have a tick box or some sort of consent mechanism. So where there was a series of actions perhaps and that the user had to go through or where the cookie notice was displayed in a way that people couldn't avoid seeing it. And that's why we got this proliferation of big banners whenever you visit a website saying, we use cookies, if you can, uh, continue, then you're, you're consenting to that. 
And that's led to a lot of confusion, a lot of amb ambiguity. We've got the guidance saying one thing, um, practice very different to that, and then enforcement different again. And of course, in terms of what, how organisations use tracking technology, that's changed a lot over the last seven years. Got a lot more behavioural advertising, a lot more embedded content within, within websites, mobile apps have taken off, um, a lot more tracking is going on um, in online services. We've also got fingerprinting as well, where um, an organisation is able to actually identify you as an individual um, through looking at, say, your browser, your device type, your IP address, what Wi-Fi network you're connected to, what screen resolution you have, and actually from that build up a picture and uh, identify you as an individual. Um, and the other thing, going back to the point around embedded content, is that quite often operators of websites, you know, if you embed third-party content, say social sharing buttons, you've got no idea how that third party is actually then using using that content. So it's been, as I say, a lot of a lot of confusion, um, a lot of ambiguity. With GDPR, the test for consent. It's a, um, was GDPR consent, so that was a big change as well. And that led to uh, some new guidance coming out from the Information Commissioner uh, over the summer. So what, what did they say? Well, you've got to provide individuals clear and user-friendly information onto, as to how you use cookies and, and how um, what purpose you'll be using them for. And that's got to be done prior to the cookies actually being set. So this idea you can set a cookie by giving someone those at the same time doesn't work. You've got to actually give them the information before the, the cookie is set. And people have got to have a, a genuine choice. And I'll talk a bit more about cookies walls later on. <coughs> but the, the key thing, I think, is that the ISO has been quite clear in saying that a failure to engage with a, a consent request can't be taken as, as consent. So this idea of implied consent, which conceptually has always been very difficult for me to understand as a data protection lawyer, um, has so if you, um, has the ISO has said no, you can't, you can't do that, and you see there's some examples there, where uh, the ISO says you know, website sets um, non-essential cookies on the landing page. Um, the consent mechanism says by continuing to use our website, you consent to our use of cookies, and the ISO is now quite clear that that sort of approach is not is not valid consent. So not a huge surprise in terms of if you look at the, what the legislation says, but for a lot of organisations that's going to require you to have a look at what you're, what you're doing and how, how you actually deal with getting valid consent. And again, in the guidance there's some examples there of um, consent mechanisms that the ISO doesn't think are acceptable. So a big green accept button and then a tiny little reject button it doesn't like. Um, and even, even more abhorrent, a big green accept button and then no option but to click on more information but no way of actually um, opting uh, or rejecting uh, your, your consent. So I mentioned cookies well. So this is where, in order to access a site, you've got to accept cookies. And it's quite a common mechanism that's used, particularly in um, media, where they rely on a lot of online advertising and behavioural advertising. And it might be that in order to access, say, a newspaper's website, you've got to agree to um, accepting uh, online tracking cookies. So we have recital 43 of, of GDPR, and this is, uh, this is relevant because we're talking about the GDPR test for whether you've got valid consent. And what recital 43 says is that consent isn't presumed to be freely given if it does not allow separate consent to be given for different processing activities, um, despite being appropriate for individual case or in the forms of a contract, including the provision of a service is dependent on the consent, despite not being necessary. So what that's saying is, if accepting that cookie is not necessary in order to access that service, you can't, you can't uh, rely upon and that as a condition for accessing the, the service. The privacy directive, which is the specific legislation that deals with consent to, to cookies, um, however, says access to specific website content can be made conditional upon the well-informed acceptance of a cookie or similar devi device if it's used for a legitimate purpose. So the question here is, what is the legitimate purpose? And so what the ICO is saying on this is that you can make, you, know, you can use acceptance cookies as a condition for accessing certain parts of a site, but only in limited situations. So it has to be you know, justifiable as being legitimate and necessary for accessing that service. And, it, and they expressly say that online advertising is not a legitimate purpose. So if you have a site that's funded by online advertising, what the ISO is saying is 
you have to give the individuals the, the ability to opt out of that targeted advertising and just access using using non-targeted advertising. And that, that I think, will be um, you know, challenging for, for some organisations that rely upon um, targeted advertising and, and what they claim is additional revenue they get through um, using that form of, of advertising. The other interesting point I mentioned before about you know, the, the proliferation of, of embedded third-party content, so social sharing buttons, you know, YouTube videos, um, Google Maps, whatever it may be, is around th um, first and third-party cookies. So a first-party cookie is one that's set by the operator of that website. A third-party cookie is a cookie that's set by um, a third party. So if you have embedded content in your site, say a YouTube video, then if Google is setting a a cookie for that, and that would be a, a third-party cookie. And again, none of this is, is really a surprise, but it, it's helpful for the ICO to actually set it down and to make the position clear on this, that the obligation to get consent also applies to third-party cookies as well. And that obligation sits on, on the provider of that website. So if you have embedded content, it's your organization that's responsible for getting consent to those third-party cookies. But remember, in order for that consent to be valid, you've got to give people information on how that's going to be used got to deal with how you deal with um, the rejection of that, that consent. So that could be challenging in terms of actually how do you provide individuals with, with information on those third party cookies? How do you know what Facebook or Google or whoever it may be is actually going to do with um, the, the information they get through that cookie, what tracking they're doing? And I think we'll see third parties provide a lot more information to organizations to help them build that into their, their cookie consent mechanisms. So. Some challenges there as well, you know, thinking about how you actually, if you use a cookie consent tool on your website, how that's properly configured. So avoiding using pre-typed boxes, ensuring that you provide appropriate information. If you have an accept all button, how are you ensuring people actually have enough information before they click on that button? Because again, it's quite clear that if you just click and accept all without being told what you're accepting, that won't be, won't be valid consent. And this last point here, you know, the, the really interesting thing for me is that a lot of this is technical work. So you'll be reliant upon your, your IT teams or your, your web designer, your, your marketing agency to actually implement a lot of this stuff. And I find when I speak to them, you know, there's quite a lot of, you know, sometimes there's misunderstanding in terms of how these rules work. So it's, I think it's a real joint effort between legal and IT to actually ensure that um, cookies and, and tracking technologies are, are used properly. You know, it's, it's, I wouldn't leave it just one or the other. I'm, you know, I'm a lawyer, I can advise on this sort of stuff. I can't code your website for you. But just as I say, if you're using a third-party design agency, make sure you ask lots of questions around how they are configuring your, your cookies and your tracking technologies. Know what's actually on, on your site, in your mobile apps, in your, your email marketing systems, and actually ensure that you're, you're getting appropriate consent for that. Another area where we get lots of questions is around, around analytics. So um, these are, you know, a lot of you have Google Analytics on your website or other things to, to work out who visits your site, what they're doing, where they're going. Um, and the ICO has said in its guidance that um, analytics cookies are not strictly necessary. It doesn't think these are a requirement or, or necessary in order to actually run a website. And that, that's a bit odd because if you look at what the Irish um, data protection regulator is saying, they, they don't really mention that in their guidance. Kineo, the, the French regulator, um, who is probably one of the most um, aggressive regulators within the, within the EU, it says that first-person analytics are fine. They have no issue with it. And we've also got a draft e-privacy regulation, which um, will come into force at some point um, in the next uh, year or two, which expressly mentions first-party web audience measurement, so analytics in any other language, um, as being something that doesn't require consent. So we've got this slightly odd conflict between what the ICO is saying just now in terms of the use of analytics and what other regulators in the EU are saying, and also what the draft legislation um, that will replace the current laws is saying on this. So my, my question on this is, you know, will the ICO actually act actively ever enforce this part of its guidance? Because yeah, it, it seems at odds with what uh, its, its fellow regulators in other countries are saying and, and where, where the legislation is going. So we'll see, see what happens in that. Just in terms of, I mentioned that this, this all applies to non-essential cookies. The guidance um, has a helpful summary of some things. I'm not going to go through all of this, but um, you, you can read it um, afterwards. But it does give some guidance as to what sort of cookies and tracking technologies it thinks are essential and what are not, so where, where you require consent and where, where you might not require consent. 
So just to finish off on, on that section, um, what the, the ISO has indicated is in terms of enforcement, it's going to be targeting um, the use of tracking technologies that it thinks are, are the highest risk, which, which makes sense. So that's particularly around user tracking and advertising and profiling and things like that. So that, that is likely to be its priority. So if your organization you know, uses tracking technologies in that way, then that, that's the key area to focus on. How do you do that? First thing, conduct a cookie audit. You may have done one back in 2011 or 2012. I can guarantee that things will have changed in that time period. Um, so look at actually what cookies you're using, why you're using them, what the purpose is, do you know what the purpose is, um, how you're getting consent, and then look at your consent mechanisms. So if you've got a cookie tool, great, but actually is it, is it configured properly? Are you getting valid consent? If you've got a mobile app where users being prompted to actually give their consent at the point that they download before they actually activate, activate the app, and then that should then give you, um, you know, something to work with in terms of an action plan to work out what changes you might need to make. Okay, next on, on e-privacy, I want to touch on um, a couple of cases that have been in the European court. So for those of you that were here back in the spring, um, we talked about these ones when we had the opinions from the Advocate General. Um, we now have the final judgment from the uh, European Court of Justice. So Fashion ID, this was all to do with using social sharing buttons on a website, so um, having Facebook like buttons. And the question was whether... Um, who's the data controller for data protection law purposes in relation to the use of a Facebook like button on a website. So the, in this case, Fashion ID said, well, it's not us because we don't know what Facebook are doing. And Facebook said, well, we're just, uh, you know, we're not really involved here. We're, um, we're not providing this website. And the issue here is that regardless of whether or not you have a Facebook account, if you visit a website with a Facebook like button on it, then certain information is sent to Facebook. So it allows them to create profiles of all individuals who visit that site, whether or not they're actually Facebook users. You get an IP address, you get um, other information, and again, go back to that fingerprinting point I was talking about before that allows, allows profiling. So what the court said is, well, actually, you're, you're joint controllers. You're jointly responsible for this. So you, Fashion ID, the, the provider of the website, um, you are responsible for getting consent to the setting of the, the Facebook cookies because you chose to put those uh, like buttons on, on your website. You're jointly responsible, but you're not jointly liable. So it's only to the extent that you are responsible or you're, you're in control of what's happening. So what Facebook then does with, with that information afterwards is Facebook's responsibility. But in terms of the initial collection, um, the parties are jointly responsible and the onus is on the operator to actually tell individuals about what Facebook is doing to actually get consent to the use of cookies, assuming they fall into non-essential, which is as well, um, before that information is then, is then transferred. So that's helpful, again, not, not a surprise if you, if you read the Advocate General's opinion, um, but helpful just in terms of confirming um, the expectations on, on operators of websites. So if you have any third-party content, this is something to, to be looking at. Planet 49, so again, we talked about this one um, earlier. This is all to do with the use of pre-ticked um, boxes um, for the acceptance cookies. Planet 49 is an online lottery website, and in order to take part, you either have to sign up to um, online advertising, uh, targeted advertising, um, or, or marketing. You, you have the choice between the two of them as to which one to accept. But the way the sign-up process worked, the, the box for cookies was pre-ticked, and you then clicked another button that said, I want to create my account or join. So the question was whether that pre-ticked box, which was nudging behavior in a particular direction, um, constituted valid consent. And, and the court has said, no, it doesn't. You've got to give people a free choice. You can't pre-tick in this way you've got to actually give them the choice side which one they want to actually to accept and then give them sufficient information to actually make that decision as well. So again, not a surprise, but um, it helps get that confirmation. Okay, so the next section I was going to talk about is on um, biometric data. So this has been in the press quite a lot over the last um, four or five months. Why is it interesting? Um, I guess biometrics are far more accessible these days. The technology is much more freely available to, to organisations to use. It's much more powerful. You know, we've had CCTV for a long time, but facial recognition technology is, is something that is now much easier to do. So um, it is something which is getting a lot of attention. But the other, the other thing um, is that it's regulated in a different way under GDPR. So under the old data protection regime there was no special treatment of biometric data being used for identification purposes. Under GDPR, that falls within what we call special category personal data, so what used to be sensitive personal data. And that then means it's subject to a much narrower list of conditions um, in, term, in 
terms of your legal basis, um, which can create some particular challenges, particularly if you deployed one of these systems two years ago and it was perfectly lawful then, you've actually now got to work out well, how, how can we continue using it. So the, the Information Commissioner has um, been talking about this. Uh, this is on the back of the story about uh, surveillance at the King's Cross uh, development in, in London, a, a big urban new generation project where with large public areas where uh, the operator was using uh, facial recognition technology. Um, and what, what the Elizabeth Denham is saying is, you know, it, and this is, again, this is, this is not a surprise to anyone who is involved in data protection law, but if you're using facial recognition technology, you've got to do it in a fair, transparent and accountable way. And take, remembering the accountability principle under GDPR, you've got to be able to document why, how and why you believe what you're doing is lawful, proportionate and justified. So this, I think, will be an area of focus over the next wee while. It's clearly a lot of tension in, in the press. Um, so one, one to keep an eye on. There was some other litigation as well involving South Wales Police um, where the court said that our trial of using facial recognition technology in public areas was lawful. Um, that's only of limited relevance for most organisations because uh, processing for law enforcement purposes is dealt with under um, different legislation. So it's under Part 3 of the uh, 2018 Act, not, not GDPR. So don't um, be uh, misled by, by the court's finding there. There's been a couple of interesting cases um, over, over the last couple of months on, on this. So in Sweden, there was a, a school which deployed facial a pilot of facial recognition technology within the school for the purposes of attendance monitoring. So they were trying this new system where the cameras would just look and be able to say, right, Martin's turned up today, that's fine, he's here. Next day, he's not here, and keep a record without needing to have the teachers call out the register or, or however else it was done. So this was a pilot, it only applied to one school and to one class in the school, and it was only for a limited period of time. And the way the, um, the school w was dealing with it in terms of uh, legal, a legal basis, bearing in mind that this is a special category of personal data, um, is that it was based on not just consent, but parental consent. So parents had to expressly say that they were happy for their child to take part in this, this trial, which doesn't seem an unreasonable way to deal with it. But the, the Swedish Data Protection Authority thought differently. So they said, firstly, that consent was invalid because of the imbalance in the relationship and that uh, in this case they thought that actually the consent given by the parents wasn't freely given. They didn't really have a, a free choice. I'm not sure I necessarily agree with. If it was a pilot, they probably did have a, a genuine choice. If this was being rolled out across the school, then yeah, I can perhaps, perhaps agree with that. But they also, and this is the really interesting point for me, they said facial recognition technology is not necessary for the purposes of monitoring attendance. Couldn't be justified as being necessary because there were less in privacy intrusive ways of doing this. So whether that's a teacher calling out a register or people signing in themselves, they said, you don't need to use facial recognition technology to do this. You can't justify it on that basis. And they were fined 20,000 euros for this, this pilot. So for me, I mean, the, the, the key thing here is, you know, the, it's this point around proportionality and justifying something as being necessary. So if it's an organization, you're looking to, looking to use biometric uh, tracking some way, so it might be a fingerprint scanner, you know, to access part of your building, um, it might be um, facial recognition technology, voice recognition or whatever, you know, think carefully about how you're actually justifying this as being necessary. Do a data protection impact assessment, weigh up the risk and actually ensure you can document why what you're doing is, is lawful and justified, because if you can't, then the first thing the information commission is going to do is say, well, like, can I see you're working on this? And if you can't show them why it's lawful or why you think it's lawful, you're automatically on the back foot and you're going to struggle to actually justify what what you've done. The other, the other case I want to talk about is, this is from the Netherlands, this is a Dutch retailer um, who was deploying um, fingerprint scan authorization for cash registers. So rather than users have to type in a code um, to log into the cash register, they just put the fingerprint on it and that authorised them as being a, um, someone who could, could use the cash register. Um, and as I said, you know, under GDPR, um, using biometric data for the purpose of identification is special category personal data. So you've got a much tougher um, hoops to go through in terms of justifying it as being, as being lawful. And the retailer said, well, we did this for security reasons. It's a far more secure system than a you know, six digit or four digit number, password, whatever it is, that someone could um, you know, steal by uh, shoulder surfing. 
and the court disagreed. They said that the retailer hadn't been able to show that they'd explored alternatives here. They hadn't carried out a data protection impact assessment, so they couldn't show they'd actually done the full assessment here. So again, they said this, this is actually unlawful. And I think this is a good example of where, you know, this was technology that was lawful, you know, pre-GDPR, you wouldn't have had to go through quite so many hoops for this. Um, you could have relied perhaps on legitimate um, interests as your legal basis. That's all changed with GDPR. And I think there'll be a lot of systems out there you know, that organisations use where actually they may have had them for, you know, three or four years and not actually realised that GDPR has, has meant that they have to reassess the, the lawfulness and, and validity of that system. So something to look at. And again, you know, the importance of doing a data protection impact assessment absolutely fundamental to, to have done your assessment and be able to show your show you're working. Okay, so next section we're going to talk about um, is on data subject requests um, and a couple of cases that came out. Uh, this was just actually probably back in May time and then some new guidance over the over the summer. So the first case, and again, for those of you who are regular attendees of this, this um, update, you'll have heard us talk about uh, Dawson Damer before. Um, this is litigation that's gone for several years involving the English law firm Taylor Wessing, um, who are a uh, solicitor to, um, in relation to a Bahamian trust. Um, and Dawson Damer is the beneficiary under that trust. And there's been a long running litigation uh, relating to a subject access request that Dawson Damer remained to find out certain information held by Taylor Wessing um, in relation to that um, trust. So this went all the way up to the High Court, uh, the, sorry, the Court of Appeal in England, and it was then remitted back to the High Court uh, for the High Court to make a decision on certain aspects of it. And there, there are two particular things I wanted to pick up on today. The first one is around searching your paper records. So you, you know under data protection law, yes, you have to search your electronic systems, but you also have to search your paper records as well, where they're part of what we call a relevant filing system. And the question for the court was, are the files that a law firm has um, a relevant filing system if they're in paper form? And the court said, yes, they are. And as part of this, what they were doing is they were looking at a couple of things. So firstly, there was a case have years ago called Durant, which um, was sort of the leading case in terms of the interpretation of um, the definition of personal data in the UK. But since then, we've had uh, the European um, Charter come in, which has enshrined greater rights than individuals in relation to privacy. And that, I think, has shifted the balance a wee bit in terms of how you assess the balance between the individual and the, the burden on, on the organisation. And the court in Dawson Damer has, has moved on from Durant a bit. So what they said is that paper filing system, um, genetic description arranged in chronological order, is a relevant filing system for the purposes of data protection law and is therefore within the scope of a um, data subject access request. And they said in particular that page turning 35 paper files is not unduly onerous. So bad news for law firms, so lots of paper files, um, perhaps uh, good news for um, people trying to get access to some of the information. A lot of you, I suspect, will have paper records out there. This may impact on how you deal with data subject requests. You may previously have thought that some of them were, were out of scope. Um, Maybe time to, to have another look at that. And also things like paper records, workbooks held by employees. You know, if you've got a diary or something and you can find information on it, I think it's difficult to argue that that's not a relevant finding system if you look at Dawson Damer. The other thing that the, the court, uh, High Court was asked to look at was on <coughs> disproportionate effort. So again, this was a, a 98 Act case, so this is not GDPR, albeit the litigation is still ongoing, but they were looking at the, uh, how disproportionate eff effort was, was measured. And what the court said is, and this is quite helpful, is that the, the effort involved in searching for non-exempt information is not in itself a justification for refusing to provide the information. So you've actually got to be able to think, you justify the time and cost. So if you're, if you're going to go down the route of saying, we're not going to respond to this because it would take disproportionate effort, you've actually got to be able to say, and we estimate it's going to take this number of weeks or this amount of money to do this. You can't just say, well, you know, we've got 40 hours to go through that, so that's too difficult. You've got to be able to show you're working and actually how you're actually getting to that conclusion, why you think yet yeah, that is a, a disproportionate amount of, of effort. The court also said that searching backup systems may, may be um, disproportionate. So in this case here, Taylor Wessing used uh, Mimecast, a sort of email backup archiving system. Um, they said, well, if you're searching your primary email system, you don't need to search the backup as well because it's going to have the same stuff in it. You don't need to look at that. It's helpful for, for organisations. 
but they, um, they did say that searching personal storage areas um, would not be disproportionate. So if you have employees who are saving stuff on a local drive rather than on the network, your DSAR needs to be looking at what they're saving locally. So you need to speak to the people involved and say, you know, what have you searched locally? Carry out searches of their, their local device, their laptop, uh, their, their desktop PC or whatever, um, if, if you allow people to save stuff locally. And the final point they said is, you know, that this, this was clearly a, a DSAR that would be made in, in contemplation of litigation or perhaps with a view to litigation. Um, they said you know, the, the motive there is, is irrelevant. So the fact that this person was possibly going to be looking to um, bring a claim against uh, uh, on the back of the information they got was not, not a relevant factor. Oh. Okay, the, the second case um, I was going to talk about is uh, Rudd versus Brittle. So this isn't, isn't one we, we've spoken about before. This is a, um, uh, Mr. Rudd is a medical expert on um, asbestos and, and the, the damage that, that can cause um, to individuals. Uh, Bridal Bridal um, is a lobbyist for the asbestos industry, so he is um, was trying to um, get Rudd struck off by the General Medical Council. And Dr. Rudd made a, a data subject access request against um, Bridal to um, find out what information he had in them and what was being done with that information. So a number of interesting points come at this. The first one is a really useful reminder. I, mean, I think we, again, we probably all know this, but we sometimes forget the point that the right under data protection law is not a right to documents, it's a right to data. And those are not necessarily the same thing. So data is contained within documents, but that doesn't mean you have an automatic right to the whole document itself. Quite often we disclose the whole document, but actually that may not always necessarily be, be necessary. When carrying out a search, controllers only require to act reasonably and proportionately. Um, follows on from the last case we talked about. Um, but again, uh, following on to the Taylor Westing one, if an exemption is claimed, you've got to be able to show that's properly substantiated. So you've got to be able to show you're working and justify why you're, you're applying an exemption. In this case, uh, Redder was looking to uh, apply the, the exemption for um, regulatory processing. The court said here, well, no, you're not a regulator. You can't rely upon, upon this exemption. <coughs> um, so, which is, is helpful in terms of interpretation. And then the other two points are quite interesting. So the court said there's no right to know the identities of the individual recipients of data, um, but you are entitled to know the description of the classes or types of recipients. And that's interesting if you compare it to the guidance that the Article 29 Working Party issued in advance of GDPR and transparency, where they said actually you should be telling people about the in your privacy notice about the identities of individuals. So either name them exactly or be very, very um, precise in how you describe them. So you can't just say trusted third parties, you've got to say a lot more than that. This was a data subject request, but it's the same principles we're talking about. And then the other point of interest, so again, under the 98 Act, um, when you make a subject access request, you're required to disclose the actual source um, of data. And that's consistent with what the Article 29 Working Party has said in terms of what you put in your privacy notice and um, data subject requests under, under GDPR. So you should be specific um, in terms of the uh, sources of personal data unless it's not, not possible to do so. So I mentioned we've, we've also had um, some updated guidance from the, the Information Commissioner. This, this is very odd. It kind of came out in July time with absolutely no fanfare at all. So there's no announcement on it. Um, a privacy um, a professional that I, I followed Twitter picked up on it and said, this is really odd, the ISO seems to have changed some of its guidance and said, yeah, actually we did that last month, but they didn't announce any of this. So it was done over the summer um, without, without any announcement, so you may or may not have, have seen this. The first thing they did was they have redefined a month. Um, it's quite a brave thing to do, uh, but they have changed into guidance. So they, it used to be that if you got a request on, say, the um, 10th of October, you started counting the one month period the day after that, so the response would be due by the 11th of, of November. And the ISO has actually changed that, and you now start counting it on the day that you receive the request. And they said the reason they're, they're doing this is to, to follow um, some recent EU case law from um, 2004. So after 15 years, they've decided to update their guidance to align with um, some case law. In, in seriousness, I think the reason this has come about is that with the consistency mechanism under GDPR, where our regulators are supposed to interpret stuff in the same way, they've realised this was a bit of guidance that the UK has always had that's just out of kilter with what, what other regulators are doing, um, and it's just taken until now to actually be picked up. 
there's no change to so when, if the the one month period expires on a Saturday or Sunday or a public holiday, the, there's no change to the guidance that says that your response is due by the next the next working day. But just remember, you know, this guidance is the maximum time period for issuing your response, and under GDPR, you're still supposed to do that without undue delay and in any event within within one month. So this probably shouldn't make a huge amount of difference to when you're actually providing your response. And the other thing that this guidance did was it applied some um, provided some guidance on what is meant by um, manifestly unfounded or excessive requests. So under GDPR, you can refuse or you can charge for a request where it's manifestly unfounded or excessive. And no one's really been quite clear as to what those, what those terms mean. So what does the ICO say that is meant by manifestly unfounded? Well, this, uh, what they say is, you know, this is where an individual clearly has no intention of exercising its rights and, and it's, a, it's a malicious request. So for those of you that are involved in HR and you get requests from employees or former employees, this is potentially quite an interesting one to look at in terms of what the individual is trying to do with the request. Uh, I talked before about, in um, the Taylor Weston case, about disregarding the motive, but this is the one, the one area where you may be able to look at the, the motive of the individual. So the ICO gives um, some examples of things where it thinks it may be manifestly unfounded. So the individual has expressly stated their intention to cause disruption. So if your individual's on Twitter saying, I'm going to you know, submit a whole lot of uh, data subject access requests to this organization because they've treated me really badly and I just want to really wind them up, you should all do the same. That's probably going to be um, manifestly unfounded. If they've made unstantiated accusations against the controller or specific employees, they, they think that might be a case. That's a slightly odd one because the individual may not actually be able to substantiate the claim until they've made their DSAR. So we'll see how that one plays out. If they're targeting a particular individual or there's some sort of personal grudge going on, again, that would be manifestly unfounded. Or if it's a systematic campaign with lots of different requests being sent on a regular basis um, with the intention of causing disruption, again, the ISO is saying, well, in that case, you may be able to rely upon um, the manifestly unfounded exception. But it, you know, it's, the purpose has got to be disruption or malice. And what the ISO is also very clear about is you've got to be able to actually show why you've reached that conclusion. So you've got to be able to justify and say why you've concluded that this is actually a manifestly unfounded, unfounded request. On excessive requests, so um, this it really is, you know, there was some, some people have wondered whether actually this might apply if people made a request for lots and lots of data. That's not what this one's about. This is about um, making a, a repeat of a previous request and say there not being a reasonable period that has elapsed between that, that request and the next request. So you're just consistently putting in requests without there ever being any change, um, creating more and more disruption, or it's overlapping with other requests. <coughs> but again, you've got to show you're working this. So a reasonable request, a reasonable interval, you've got to consider on a case-by-case -case basis. So for some organizations, a reasonable interval might be a week because you may be collecting so much data on a week-by-week -week basis that actually there has been a big change in that time period. For other organizations, it might be six months because nothing has really changed. So, again, quite useful to get this guidance, but just apply some care when um, you're looking, looking to, to apply it and be able to justify what you're doing. The ICU also says that a request isn't excessive just because the individual has, has requested a large amount of data or asked for further copies. Um, on the further copy point, GDPR expressly provides for uh, charging where people are looking for additional copies of data. And if the request is for a large amount of information, then you are entitled to go to the individual and say, what exactly are you looking for? This is going to take a long time to pull together. Can you help me narrow the request so I can find that? But you can't just rule it out to being excessive just because they've requested lots and lots of data. I say, I, um, it's just really, really a recap, and this is some link, a link to the guidance down there. But it's really, the onus is on, on the controller to actually be able to justify the application of these, these exceptions. Um, you know, don't have a blanket policy of refusing certain types of requests. Ensure that you're actually documenting your decision and you can justify that because if the individual goes to the ICO and complains, then the ICO will say to you, well, why have you, why have you applied this? Why did you think that was the right thing to do? And if you can't provide that, or you can't show that you actually thought about that at the point of the response, then you're going to be, you're going to be on the back foot. Okay, um, so the next section is just looking at some other um, enforcement action uh, and other recent cases um, which uh, may be of interest. So the first one I'll talk about, we've spoken a bit before about electronic marketing um, 
and the ICO has been issuing a large number of fines to organisations for, you know, particularly for spam emails, for spam text messages, where um, the, the organisation has not got consent to that, or they sent them to people where, uh, is it, where they haven't consented. And this is going back to PECR, Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations, which say you can't send that without having, having prior consent. And there was some enforcement action taken against EE, the, the mobile company, um, early in the summer. And what they were trying to do was to get people to use their new mobile app for managing their account, which seems a, a valid thing to do. They sent messages to 2.5 million people. Um, but those messages, to try and encourage people to use the app, they all said, and you can use this to upgrade your phone. So why don't you go in there and you can use this and you have a look at all the new phones we can offer to you? And that was where they, they tripped up because the ICO said, well, you're trying to justify this as being a service message and therefore not electronic marketing because you're telling people about a new function they can access as part of the account. But in that message, you have said to them, you can find out, upgrade your phone. And actually that is trying to sell a service. So that immediately took that message out of the service message category into marketing. And they got fined £100,000 for that. But conversely, we've had some new guidance from Ofcom, and this is aimed at um, providers of broadband, so they have a new duty to tell people when your broadband contract comes to the end of its term. So you've got a 12-month contract, 24-month contract, saying you're at the end of your term. Actually, you can move to a cheaper contract um, you know, you're, because our prices have come down that time period. So this is a, Ofcom trying to get uh, you know, it's a bit similar to what's happening in the energy industry as well, trying to ensure that consumers are being given, given good value in terms of the contracts they have. So Ofcom is requiring broadband providers to send out an email to the customers with tariff information. Is that marketing? Well, the Ofcom guidance has a section in it which they say, well, we spoke to the ICO about this, and the ICO said that sort of message is contractual. So it's not marketing, provided it's written in neutral and factual language. So it's saying, here is the, here's the cheaper tariff you could be on. It's not saying come and get our best deal or anything like that. And I think this is quite quite helpful guidance. So for those of you who are in, say, financial services, and I know some organisations have struggled with this um, challenge between what the FCA requires in terms of treating customers fairly and telling people about, say, being able to move to a better value product, get more interest on their, you know, their savings account or trying to get people to put more money into the pension scheme, whatever it may be. And then you've got the, ICE, the pecker on the other hand. They've struggled with that, how you balance that those those two bits. And I think this is quite helpful guidance to look at if you're if you're in that area. It gives you a bit of comfort that if you are doing what the regulator requires you to do, and you construct that as a genuine service message or a contractual obligation, then you you shouldn't be breaching pecker. But it's absolutely fundamental. Those messages are are written in very plain, and neutral language, and they're not written with a marketing spin in them. And I've I've seen you know, some of the internal challenges with that within some organisations where people have looked at what say the FCA is requiring to do and said well great we can try and sell these products, well no, that's not what that's a, this is about, this is about giving people a specific information, it's not a backdoor, backdoor to marketing so helpful guidance um, and perhaps um, yeah, just the importance is looking at how those messages are phrased Okay, the, the next case I was going to talk about is uh, bounty so anyone who's been in a maternity ward over the last 30 years, I think, may have come across a bounty person trying to um, take advantage of people in a pretty vulnerable situation and sign them up for um, a whole load of marketing. Um, they purport to be a parenting club, um, but actually they were really operating as a data broking service for uh, until 2018. And they sent out, they shared 34 million um, records with marketing credit agencies. So this is going to be people like Expedian and others um, they were selling a huge amount of data they collected on maternity wards under the guise of signing people up for some free pampers and nappies and a, a discount voucher and booze. And the ICO received a complaint about this and they, they found that Bounty wasn't being transparent in terms of what it was doing. Its privacy notice did say that it shared data with other people, but it didn't list the four big recipients of that. So there were four people who got most of the information here. They didn't actually name those and make them clear. And they said, you know, these are vulnerable people. You've got mothers who have just given birth on a maternity ward. You've got someone coming round, taking their details. They're in a vulnerable situation. You know, the way this was done was just, just not lawful. They were collecting information on the child's sex and date of birth. And again, this was being handed over, and they were taking advantage of, of, of the individuals involved. 
and they were fined £400,000, which under the, the old 98 Act was um, pretty high, so the maximum fine was half a million pounds. And Bounty has made some fundamental changes to its business model since that. You, you see that they stopped acting as a data broking service in April of 2018. GDPR came in in, in May 2019, uh, 2018, so there's, there's no um, coincidence there in terms of um, you know, the, the change, but I see quite, quite a substantial fine and a good reminder just about the importance <coughs> of, of transparency. Uh, so the um, next one I'm going to talk about is the, the British Airways fine. So I said before, this is, um, although it's a headline grabbing figure, um, this is a, a, only a proposed fine, so it's not actually been issued yet. We're not clear when it will actually be issued, um, but there's some interesting things here. So firstly, the size of it, £183 million. Pounds, is a substantial amount of money, even for someone like uh, British Airways or, or IAG, you know, who have a turnover in, in the billions. Um, this was all to do with a cyber incident on their website, so which they discovered in September 2018, so after GDPR came in. And it involved user traffic that was being diverted to a fraudulent website. So the way the BA site worked when you were booking was that you were sent out to a third party website for a certain part of the booking and payment process. And somewhere in that third party service, there was a malware attack where um, that data was being scraped. So it wasn't actually on the BA site itself. It was on a service that BA was using that the data was then being taken from. And they, they got access to half a million um, customers' uh, details on, on this. Um, so I think just you know, important this you know, it, around looking at how particularly online services are constructed and the use of third party services, how do you ensure that you are actually um, you know, keeping top of the, the security of those. Are you doing audits on your on your service providers? The Marriott one is quite interesting as well. So again, th this is uh, another proposed fine. It was issued the, the week after um, the British Airways one. Um, what, what I think is particularly interesting about this again, a high a high figure. But this was all to do with a uh, vulnerability in um, a reservation system run by Starwood. Um, a hotels chain which Marriott had bought in 2016. The vulnerability is thought to have been around since 2014. It was identified in November 2018 and affected about 340 million guest records around the world, of which 7 million related to, to UK residents and those ones the ICO was interested in. And we haven't, again, because we haven't had a final decision, we haven't got the full reasoning on this, but the ICO has said, and what it's published so far, is that an aggravating factor here was the fact that Marriott, when it bought Starwood in 2016, didn't do appropriate IT security diligence on, on Starwood when it bought it. So it, the ICO was saying, had you carried out proper diligence as part of your acquisition process, you might have picked up on this and it might be identified. But the fact you bought this company without doing appropriate diligence on their IT, IT systems and the security of those is an aggravating factor here. So actually, that means you're getting a higher fine you might otherwise have, have received. Quite an interesting one. If you're involved in any M and A, uh, you know, acquiring a business, don't you know, and you're doing your your diligence on the on the um, target. You know, look at IT systems. You know, particularly if they are um, consumer facing systems or they're holding a large amount of personal data. You know, check when the target last did a security audit, when they last did penetration testing. Consider carrying out your own testing as part of that, or following on from the acquisition. Because if you don't, and this an issue comes out, the ISO has made it pretty clear that they will view that as being a an aggravating factor. Moving on to employment, so um, I said we'd jump around Europe a wee bit, uh, we're off to Greece now. Um, this is an interesting one again for those of you involved in HR, uh, involved PwC in, in Greece. And they require their employees there to consent to the processing of data. Now, if any of you have been to our previous sessions, you'll know that GDPR expressly says that you can't generally rely upon consent in the employment context because the imbalance between the employer and the employee is too great and consent is unlikely to be freely given. But PwC Greece, for whatever reason, decided they were going to ask consent or acquire consent from the employee to certain processing. And the Hellenic uh, Data Protection Authority um, got wind of this and investigated and they said, well, the consent here is not valid, so your legal base isn't valid. But actually, you had a, you're processing on another legal basis anyway. You didn't need to get employees' consent but you didn't tell the employees about that other legal basis, and you were going to do this anyway. 
So not only did they not have valid consent, but they'd also breached the transparency and accountability principles as well. And they were fined 150,000 euros. So key lessons here, um, avoid uh, relying upon consent with employees. Um, yeah, I think we, we all know that. But also don't use consent if you have another legal basis. So actually don't, you know, consent should always be the last thing you look to in terms of legal basis. If there's something else available, then rely upon that. Don't, don't go to consent. And ensure your processing is transparent as well. So make clear what your legal bases are in your privacy notice. Explain them to the individuals, you know, whether they're employees or whether they're you know, their customers or other third parties. You know, be transparent about that. And don't, don't be misleading with, with what you're actually doing. OK, uh, off to Romania now. Um, so this was a, a Romanian bank. Um, and they, in their transaction history for um, account holders, um, displayed the individual's national ID number. So they collected the ID number for some reason as part of transactions, and then in your transaction history, they would actually display the, the um, national ID number when you're looking at your, your transactions. And this is quite interesting because this, this looks at the principle of data protection by design and about ensuring that you incorporate data protection um, from the outset and system design, how you configure, configure services. And they said, well, that's excessive processing of personal data. You don't need to put someone's national ID number in there. You might have collected it as part of the transaction, but you shouldn't be serving it up and displaying it every time someone looks at transaction history because that's just not necessary or, or appropriate. And they said, well, you failed to comply with the principle of data protection by design, so they were fined 130,000 euros. Again, just a useful reminder about you know, thinking about data protection at the outset of a project, you know, whether it's implementing a new system um, or designing some new, new functionality. You know, ensure that you're taking a privacy-first approach to design and not just including information or collecting information just because you can. Um, and think about, you know, again, I've talked about data protection impact assessments, but think about it, how you assess the risks, how do you decide what you're including or displaying at a certain point in a, in a process and ensure that you can justify what you're, what you're doing. So that's the um, main part of the presentation. Just in terms of what's on, on the horizon, what, what might we be talking about next time you meet, um, we may have an update on Schrems 2. So for those of you... Um, uh, been here previously, you remember that Max Schrems is the individual who brought down Safe Harbour for US data transfers. <coughs> He's currently bringing litigation um, in the European courts in relation to the use of the standard contractual clauses and uh, privacy shield for data transfers to the US. There was a hearing on that in July. We will get the decision on that, I suspect, in the next six months or so. The Morrison's case on vicarious liability, this is the one about the individual who posted details of employees on, on the internet and there's a class action by Morrison's employees as, uh, against Morrison's um, claiming vicarious liability for what this, this rogue individual did. That is going to the Supreme Court in November, um, so we will uh, perhaps have a judgment in that um, when we meet in spring. E-privacy regulations, so this, this has been running on for, for years. Uh, the Finnish presidency has published another text. Um, we are still some way off actually having a politically agreed text within the member states, never mind actually uh, text is agreed by the Commission and, and the European Parliament, so that's some way away. We may find out what's happening with the, the fines for British Airways and Marriott. Uh, there will be some finalised data sharing code of practice from the ICO, so they consulted in this early in the summer. We um, should get the final code soon. Uh, we are, I'm told, going to get some guidance from the European Data Protection Board on joint controllership. So when are you joint controllers? Um, when are you not joint controllers? What are the factors? I've spoken to people at the, the Information Commissioner's office and they said they're not um, planning anything imminent, trying to anything imminently, but they understand the European Data Protection Board will be providing guidance on this, which will be very helpful. And then finally, on artificial intelligence, the ISO has been doing a lot of work on that this year. They've been doing various calls for information and consul uh, consultations, um, and they are expected to provide guidance um, early in 2020 on the use of artificial intelligence. So that's me done. Um, that's us on the questions bit, um, so we'll, we'll cut the cameras. Um, any, any questions?